Final Fantasy 13 branches out from its predecessors, which is honestly a common thing for Final Fantasy to do as a series. Each game in the mainline works as a sort of theme and variation from one another, two built on the class options from one, giving you intimate control on how each character develops, three lets you learn new classes and swap as you go, four preset your party and focus on storytelling, five let you customize each class with abilities from the other, Six developed a character identity while giving you some free control over how they learned magic. Seven made leveling magic its own independent thing, departed from how your characters develop. Eight had the junction system. Nine was a return to form but added abilities. Ten had a party swap mechanic mid battle and the sphere grid. Eleven was an MMO. Twelve was MMO esque with the license system. And thirteen stripped out exploration, stripped out towns and inns and the very nature of dungeon crawling, perhaps one of the few elements that had existed throughout the series. This is infamously referred to as the hallway, and for what 13 was as tempting, the kind of story 13 is telling about fate and free will and the terror of an authoritarian state kind of works. It is a common critique on the game that the opening is tedious, doesn't allow for a great amount of creative exploring, it doesn't even allow a lot of character customization, and on a mechanical level I can see why it's initially difficult to really get into. There's not a lot of fun to be had, strictly from a gameplay perspective, until much later. And for the people who find that uninviting, I can absolutely understand that. However, these sensibilities work to help reinforce the story, something else that often gets panned. So let's break it down. This. This is a story about six characters. Lightning, whose sister is hurt by these godlike forces beyond her comprehension. Her sister's fiancé, Snow, who single-mindedly seeks to help her. Saz, whose son is similarly cursed by the same forces. Hope, who loses his mother because of the revolt against the state. Vanille, a girl from the enemy nation who was sent to destroy the theocracy. And Fang, who was the calamitous force from 500 years ago, brought back again to finish the job. The story is also about Sarah, Lightning's sister, a puppet to the whims of the gods of this land, the Fal Sea. Each character traffics entirely within some form of religious doctrine, from Daisley, the head of the state that enacts the Purge in order to deport or exterminate anyone who comes in contact with one of the enemy gods, this alienation from other people, being seen as an outsider, an enemy, a threat to people, follows these characters throughout the game. Most of these characters... Uh, most of these characters were, at some point, seen as part of the community. Lightning was essentially a cop in a small town, living with Sarah and Snow and his friends. Hope was a boy from the city. Saz was an airship pilot. And then, at once, they became enemies. Maybe these things didn't hit as hard back in 2009, but maybe these themes are worth revisiting now. Allegory, as a type of story, is very tastefully defined by the website Shmoop. Thusly, an allegory is a story with, count them, two levels of meaning. First, there's the surface of the story, you know, the characters and plot and all that obvious stuff. Then there's the symbolic level, or the deeper meaning, that all that jazz uh, on the surface represents. One of the primary issues in trying to address this game only on the first level interpretation is excessively well-trodden ground. Most critics of the game talk explicitly and openly about the characters and the plot and all that obvious stuff as nonsensical. Uh, and there is a really simple logic to that interpretation. The game starts you in media res, uh, alluding to characters, objects, subjects, all with odd names kind of circling around things that we haven't really had the chance to catch up with. We're just given a direction and a vague understanding that the game wants you to regress because story stuff will happen. Notably, Design Doctor, a very good channel on YouTube, I'm sure, compares this with Final Fantasy X and praises X for a more efficient storytelling method, uh, one with a more classical audience surrogate who has to have the rules of the world explained to him in order to proceed. And if we were only looking for one kind of story, I can see why that makes sense. But what is really interesting in 13's narrative is what's happening on the deeper meaning level, because how this game explores the deeper meaning is both textual and mechanical. Remember that this game is about free will in response to divine authority, a, a pretty well-versed topic for the series, but look back to those other games to talk about railing against some kind of preordained destiny. Well, for starters, there's religious iconography in the final boss of Final Fantasy II, where you fight the Emperor of Hell and then the Emperor of Heaven in the second part uh, in the remake. 
Final Fantasy VI has a false god of a ruined land where the entire world is suffering uh, over the cruelties of this one figure. Final Fantasy VII refers to Sephiroth as the one-winged angel, a portent of destruction and that, again, terrorizes the world. Only The only really significant religious upheaval I can think of is in Ten, where the reveal that the faith in the land is bad, that Yuna's sacrifice would ultimately be in vain, and that the system itself was wrong, and by then you have the support of most of the community regardless. There's no real mechanical change from rejecting the system. So what's different in 13 is that you begin in opposition to the world around you. So what's different in 13 is that you begin in opposition to the world around you. Even if at first you have the people's favor uh, railing against a system that separates families, murders loved ones, uh, over even the most brief contact with the enemy, you become the enemy. A point that's established often and regularly is one that seems to be lost on many critics is that you are, from rather early on in the game, considered an enemy of the entire nation. Design Doctor points this out rather eloquently when they say, It's very ironic for a game themed around fighting against fate to have such a linear system. But that's the point. Fighting against fate isn't portrayed as liberating, but restrictive. Towns aren't safe spaces to learn more about the world, buy things, and recover. Towns are hostile. Everyone, e even the children in these cities, hate and fear you in equal measure. You start from an escape, to an impotent assault on the forces that doomed your sister, to escape again from a society that wants and or needs you dead. There is no such thing as rest. Until the one moment Hope finally reunites with his father, and even that is short-lived and ends in more violence, violence threatening more innocence by virtue of your presence alone. It makes sense that the game has such a linear system. Everything is forced. You can't start exploring the world until you're fully removed from Cocoon. Then is when the game finally opens up, and it's there that the characters all start to better come to terms with the truth of the world around them. And it's also exactly why that linearity returns when you return to Cocoon, this time on a path to the seat of power. There is no freedom in Cocoon. And as a result, there is no freedom for you while you're there. This lack of freedom is built into the level design, the story, and how your characters develop. A at the beginning of the game, you have no control over who is in your party, how your characters develop, or where to go that diverges from the primary objective. While some critics do point out the other end of this, that upon entering Pulse you have free control over your entire party, how they develop, and where to go, but there is a beautiful sense of transition that slowly filters one very rigid structure into a very open one. A at the start of the game, there is no Crystarium, no way to level your characters and get them stronger. But fighting functionally is pointless. There is only marginal benefits to fighting in the early game and a significant lack of creative strategy until after you fight Anima. From there, the system slowly begins to expand, with your party having either one or two roles uh, each max. Slowly, the more your party runs and fights and moves from one hostile location to the other, the game gives you a little more freedom, teaches you how the system works, and actually, I'm going to take a moment to talk about play conditioning one sec. H. Bomber Guy's concept of play conditioning, briefly, is similar to the idea of conveyance, where a game teaches you how its mechanics work through level design, but instead of teaching mechanics, the game teaches you a behavior. Examples he uses to describe this would be the lockpicking mechanic in Fallout 3, where you need to unlock something and can use lockpicking, or just look in the drawer nearby for the key, teaching you not how to lockpick, but that lockpicking is a waste of time because there's always a workaround. Or um, Dark Souls, which kills you and then hands you a shield with a message to use it to defend yourself, leading not to just how to mechanically use shields, but an over-reliance on shields as a whole. I, I bring this up now because Final Fantasy mechanically falls a bit into an issue with mechanics and play conditioning. A lot of early gameplay in the series places a premium on attacking, offensive magic, and healing as the core of the battle system. The first game in the series starts you with two fighters, a black mage for offensive magic and a white mage for healing, and drops you in a town where all the black magic is offensive or uh, not coded properly, whoops and all the white magic is healing, a very restrictive support move, a conditional attack move that only hurts undead, and a protect spell. Now, enemies outside are not particularly threatening. They don't take a lot of damage before they go down, they don't deal much damage, and they inflict no status effects. You could, in theory, 
try to cast sleep on them, but at a point in the game where hitting them with your knife likely kills them, what's the point? Uh, paired with the buggy coding from the original game, and you can see how the series built itself on ignoring support moves and status effects. Dealing damage and healing through enemy damage can reliably get you through a lot in this game, and that same behavior repeats itself over and over. So, what does 13 do differently? Well, it is hard to shake the kind of conditioning that went into the series, particularly as it kind of bled into a lot of RPGs in general, but they made a point to include fights built around your characters as they start to gain synergist and saboteur classes. It doesn't teach the player to use these roles perfectly, but it does take time to show you why it's important to make one of your three fighters unable to deal damage or heal, and as the game starts to pick up big and pulse with the side quests, buffing and debuffing becomes far more essential, so yeah. Part of what interests me in how this game works with this restrictive allegory, the idea of making the quest for freedom oppressive and restrictive, is that the clarity of the world grows with the complexity of the characters and the exploration of the levels and the leveling system itself. You get from the early linear stages to the mid stages where you're in cities and there are interesting diversions or paths that are not immediately clear, and it picks up more in the airship level, the m more in the warp dungeon place thing until you do finally land in the step. Your classes start from no choices and no freedom to a limited, cautious, almost trivial customization to establishing a sense of identity with each character mechanically. They all have different combination of primary roles to expanding into secondary roles. Everything grows. Everything expands out. Everything becomes more free the more you work at it. And that's beautiful. There's still a couple of elephants in the room, so let's talk about Brie Larson and Captain Marvel. Now, I haven't seen Captain Marvel yet, so whoops, but I was around when the internet got a big mad over her not smiling in her trailer, and that happened in, um, was, was that 2019? 2018? Uh, it kind of blurs together, but the point is that there is a stigma against women that don't, um, smile? Larson was mocked as being unemotional and bland and uninteresting, and that's fascinating, considering that the same critiques were levied at Lightning, seemingly justified because Final Fantasy XIII Bad Game was something of a common narrative online. And outside of talking about the dreaded hallway, a lot of this criticism was similarly launched on the characters. Lightning was unemotional and boring, Snow was a moron, Hope was a whiny loser, Vanille was kooky, Saz... I, I'm, I'm maybe not the person to talk about the way Japan tends to portray black people in the media, and that's maybe something to be said about Saz being put upon, like, beleaguered passive agent and Fang's whole, um... Anyway, the interesting thing about this is that Lightning shares a lot of similarities with Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, which also has some divisive fan opinions. I, I'm not gonna deny that, but Cloud Strife, boring, emotionless dick, wasn't a dominant narrative about a generally well-received game. They're both soldiers with trust issues that are more vulnerable than they want to be, and through the course of the game learn to accept the support of their friends, and yet the girl who doesn't smile seems to be the one that receives the emotionless bitch title for reasons that I'm sure aren't sexist whatsoever. What I find fascinating about these games is how these characters develop and how the plot starts to peel back what seems to be a standard pack of tropes. Lightning is very stoic and forceful and has to contend with what that aggressive posture does to people she cares about. Saz seems like the comedic heel to the rest of the party, but then you get to see what he was doing on the purge train, what he's had to deal with in regards to the system stealing his son away from him and weaponizing him. Snow talks about being a big hero, about saving Sarah and his friends and the city and the people, and he fails over and over until Hope finally confronts him with this truth, and at the very peak of that scene, where Hope is poised to kill him over the death of his mother, Snow puts himself in mortal peril to save him, doing something heroic when he was told he deserves to die for what he's done. Look, I really like that scene. It's a good scene. Even Vanille's seeming moon logic style quirkiness makes incredible sense as the story slowly reveals to the audience that she's always been an enemy of the state, that she's just been trying to hide, to run because of it, that every strange thing she does is a simple diversion. Also, one quick thing I, I think is worth noting, um, we're introduced first to Lightning. She's the face of the party, the initial p uh, player character, and she is, or at least was, essentially a cop. 
part of the system. The last character to join our party is Fang, who is essentially everything Cocoon fears about Pulse. She was Ragnarok 500 years ago, set to destroy Cocoon, and this, even the party configuration, shows you the journey from instrument of the system to rebel, and that's just neat. It is hard to spend a lot of time on a game that no one really talks about anymore. Square has moved on from exploiting their workers on this game to undoubtedly exploiting their workers on their more recent projects, just with very weirdly racist supporters that just say they like being overworked, which... yikes. Why bother with this game the internet laughed at and then left behind? I, I mean, outside of the growing love it seems to have in queer communities that I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Let's talk about X-Play. X-Play, way back when, was a TV show where hosts Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb reviewed video games. I remember it being funny, but I was very young and very impressionable. Like, I legit just took whatever opinion someone I liked had about a thing and agreed with it without much thought. It was only very rarely that I would find a thing uh, myself back then. Um, and one such thing was uh, Sonic Heroes. Yeah, I, <laughs> I was very into that as a kid, but when X-Play did a review of it, it broke my heart because they gave it a three out of five. Why would you do this to me, Morgan? Why would you do this? And anyway, again, impressionable youth that I was, I grew to notice the flaws in the game and it kind of soured my experience on it. I, I liked it until someone I respected told me it was bad and I remember that feeling. Mostly because I went to college and became a fan of the Spoonie Experiment and Zero Punctuation, both of whom reviewed Final Fantasy XIII. Now, this happened in kind of the reverse order. I remember watching in mild horror as Spoonie and Yahtzee tore this game apart, thinking to myself, God, how could they make this game so bad? And I bought it for cheap in order to play it with my brother and laugh at the process, but I actually started to like it. I... I Ground my characters to max level, I did all the side quests, beat every super boss in the game, I, I fell in love with this game that I thought was supposed to be a nightmare, and I felt alone. None of my friends cared. They uh, asserted that it was a bad game and that I was dumb for liking it, but it was, for me, a genuine moment of actually enjoying something on my own, divorced from someone else's opinions. And I think that matters, not just, like, personally. But the idea of having these narratives, these personalities give you a number or swear a bunch about a game, it, it can be entertaining. God knows, I love H Bomber Guy's Fallout 3 video, but it can also suck for people who are experiencing something that speaks to them. I'm not saying only good opinions are valid. You can watch this video and come out of it still hating this game, and that's fine. But I think creating an environment where people are dismissed out of hand for opinions on a piece of art that isn't in line with the bandwagon opinion is harmful. And I think making a response to a game that isn't undermining itself or preemptively apologizing for a controversial video game opinion in a TM is important. Happy 10th anniversary, Lightning. Special thanks to Ark Coon, Brandon Haney, Maria Alatran, and Narai the Redmark.